Hello. Part of a philosopher's task is to question the gods of his society, that is to examine and often criticize the beliefs that a society considers sacred and beyond reproach. But by the same token, it is also the duty of the philosopher to defend those beliefs that do in fact deserve our reverence. It is his obligation to stand up for the free society that allows him to practice his craft, because this society is often under attack, including of course by those who are its main beneficiaries. When the open society collapses and we descend into ideological tyranny from online mobs who will brook no contradiction, philosophers, people like me, uh, or really anyone who wants to think and speak freely, are the first to be sent to the guillotine, as it were, uh, which is why such a defense seems even more urgent to me now. The open society is a place where artists, thinkers, and many others may exchange their ideas and do what they do without fear of being hunted down or ostracized by the powers that be. I say the powers that be because whereas it has always been the case that there is social pressure on individuals to conform to groupthink, there is now, in addition to that, a dangerous situation where censorious online mobs and their tech CEO enablers are actually encouraged by people in government, at least here in the United States. But in order to defend the open society, we must first understand its tragic foundation. And to understand the tragic foundation, we must, as so often, begin with the Greeks. The Greek mentality is, at least from our point of view today, a tragic one. The classic description of Greek mentality as tragic is by Nietzsche, especially in his early work when he was still a uh, professor of uh, classical philology in Basel. Uh, but the point is really universal. When one attempts to look at the complete picture of anything with as many of its causes and effects as may be possible to see, which is how a philosopher must really try to look at everything, then the tragic view presents itself. Uh, this view is that there is always a trade-off. Almost all choices we make are between bad and worse, and we are forced to say no to the good because of its negative consequences, and yes to the bad because of its good consequences. And that is life. To borrow a very simple example from my time as a volunteer teacher in Namibia, many of my fellow volunteers admired the generosity that is very common in that country and in much of Africa in general. By all means, I told them, admire this generosity all you want. I admire it too. Uh, but at least be clear-headed about the fact that it reduces incentives to work, both for the uh, giver and especially for the recipient, and that it therefore holds development back. Other volunteers believe that Westerners are greedy, and indeed we may be, uh, and I too denounce greediness, like most people, uh, but their greediness is also part and parcel of more advanced economies. Nothing exists in a vacuum, and greediness can and does have both detrimental and salutary consequences, and so too with generosity. And so by trying to look at the whole picture, we are led to the Greek tragic view that I mentioned. This is a banal example, but I think it illustrates the point. People tend not to want to accept this sort of thing and to call it a false choice or some such trope because they are obsessed with perfection. They believe there can be something with only sunny sides all around it, and they are simply too emotionally exhausted and weak to commit themselves to negativity in any way. And that's one of the problems with moral purism, uh, because it only looks at what is immediate without looking at any of the long-term effects, which is what a philosopher has to do. Uh, they believe that salvation is possible. They believe in the messianic. Uh, but with a tragic view comes the realization that there is no messiah, and that one must resign oneself, like the Greeks, to living with negativity. And that is the other part of the Greek tragic view, namely that there is no paradise after death, that there is no salvation, that all we have is the present, and that we must make do with it as best we can. And this non-utopian attitude regarding life after death then becomes the norm also for this life. This acceptance of negativity is a useful starting point. We can and always should try to improve ourselves as individuals as much as possible, of course, but society as a whole can never be even close to perfection. Unless we want to become a society that simply eliminates or banishes unwanted members, and such societies of course have existed sometimes in history, and uh, occasionally, thankfully, uh, wars were waged to destroy them, uh, we need social contracts that account for even the weakest members, the most foolish and the most selfish, and there are plenty of those. This is why the only pol political philosophers whose models have achieved at least a measure of success in actual life are those who from the very outset rejected perfection. 
It is not a coincidence that the societies of such gentlemen as John Locke, Adam Smith, and Edmund Burke have existed many times in the past, do exist now, and will continue to exist, whereas the societies of such contributors as Rousseau, Marx, and Chomsky have never existed, and of course never will. The fundamental error that these latter three thinkers, among others, make is that they attempt to achieve a perfect model with imperfect components, namely human beings. The societies of the former three thinkers exist in the real world because they accept the negative and the tragic as a permanent part of the human social condition. This distinction is also paradigmatic for Plato and Aristotle. Plato's Republic is a work that seeks perfection and where therefore a large class of individuals is not tolerated. In fact, it's no coincidence that the first important political utopianist among the Greeks, Plato, uh, was also the one who began to philosophize in a more modern way about cosmic justice, and who therefore to some extent rejected the Greek tragic view of life. There is among uh, scholars a debate about how serious Plato was or was not with his political project, uh, but we can leave that aside in this context. Uh, Aristotle's politics, on the other hand, is far more realistic in tolerating imperfect people and therefore comes much closer to actually existing states. Aristotle understands that universalization with imperfect components, human beings, must necessarily reject perfection. But one should go even further. The attempt to achieve perfection in society is not only impracticable, it is in fact anti-intellectual, because it excludes contrary viewpoints. That is to say, the societies proposed by such men as Rousseau, Marx, and Chomsky are not only impracticable, but by their very nature dictatorial, because they do not tolerate the opposition of the weaker or the, in their view, imperfect elements. That is to say, on a social level, perfection equals tyranny. And so in order to be actually possible, their societies must eliminate the undesired members. And this is, in effect, what is currently going on with the cancel culture from so-called woke left-wing radicals. The members of government who cheer them on are guilty of the most vile betrayal of Anglo-Saxon political principles. It is therefore, in my opinion, the obligation of the philosopher to take sides and to reject the proponents of perfection and to defend the open society where imperfection and contrary viewpoints may and indeed must exist. The dissenting viewpoints of the latter three thinkers I mentioned are possible precisely in the open society. In their own type of society, ironically, dissent would be banned. And that, in turn, is part of the Greek tragic view. Because in standing up for the open society, I must also stand up for them, for the idiots, and for the charlatans. Thank you for watching.